war is really bad all around. So yeah. he does not maybe want to admit that he is also very damaged because you cannot visit pain on someone without visiting pain on yourself. Steve Wood, please uh, join us in conversation. We will talk about uh, Guantanamo Bay and your very, very special friendship with Mohamedou Old Sly tonight. And my name is Yuri Albrecht and I'm director of the Bali. And uh, this evening we will be talking uh, about a very, very, very special friendship. So I want to thank you both very, very much for being here and talking uh, uh, to the audience and talking to each other and talking to us. I think it's a wonderful, a wonderful thing that um, you're willing to sit here and share your friendship and uh, be able to um, uh, talk about that, uh, you know, out in the open in such a special relationship you both forged in such amazing, amazingly difficult circumstances. And Mamadou, old Sly, thank you very much. Uh, this is the fifth conversation we're conducting together uh, about your life, about uh, the things you have been going through. Um, just to remind the public for a little bit, um, you were trained as an as a engineer in Germany and um, arrested in your home country of Mauritania in 2001. And after a year, you were taken to uh, Guantanamo Bay prison where Mohamedou Oldslai, where you were held for 14 years, mostly in solitary confinement and severely tortured. No charges were ever brought against you. You were never convicted. You were never found guilty of anything you were accused of, um, and, and that after years and years of investigation. Um, in 2015, while you were still incarcerated, your book Guantanamo Diary was published. Did you know when you were going to Guantanamo, um, because you were there from 2004 to 2005, I believe, and you thought you were going to be sent to the Middle East huh, to to war. I read also that you were raised in a Republican surroundings where, you know, it, being a hero going overseas, fighting a war was something you, you know, came quite natural in your family. And so you were volunteering in the National Guard. And then to your surprise, you were sent to the Caribbean to a place you probably never heard of, Guantanamo Bay Prison. It, it had been on the news in that, around that time period. Had been know. on the news. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, you knew the name. So yeah. uh, some of the few of the names, but it was, you know, the worst of the worst. So that's all I needed to know. <laughs> the worst of the worst were the, were the people who were there. Yeah. 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 How, how did you feel about it? You know, in the U.S. military, it's like it's a thing of pride to go to war. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> and. Uh, yeah. So I was missing my chance to go to war. Which is kind of sick in, in a way, but I, I think it's wrong now, obviously. So you were sort of told that those were the worst, the worst you were going to guard, and terrible things happened to Mahamadou. And did you realize that, that things happening there, or did you never realize that? Or You kind of discover it, like, you, you hear rumors in the news and stuff, you know, and it doesn't sound like, like to me, like, America does nothing wrong. You know, George yeah. Bush is God, pretty much, yeah. you know. He's not a liar like obviously he is, but... Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> so I go there thinking, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a lot better than what it is, you know. And uh, I remember my first day working in, like, the regular cell blocks. This was before I was switched to Mohammedu, and uh, I think a second detainee, me and a uh, partner were es escorting to the showers. My partner just, like, reefing on his arm, and, like... That right there, I mean, that, that's, he would have ended up torturing people if he would have kept doing that. Like, I was, and he had a smile on his face, and like, that's why I realized it was how, it was a dark place, you know. People turn dark very easily there, you know. What do you mean with that? What, what, what happens to people? The human mind is weak. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't understand, like, uh, like the guy that did the arm twisting, like, I, I can't comprehend it. Yeah, like, was it a shock to you, dude? Yeah, oh, definitely a shock. Like, I, like I, you know, I was pro-war, pro, war, pro you know, everything in America, you know? Yeah, yeah. You'd... <laughs> or, yeah, mm -hmm. no, but to inflict pain on somebody like that, that was just, it didn't make sense to me. 
And then how did you, because that's, that's, that's pretty shocking eh, when you, you think you're going to, to do the right thing and suddenly you're there. And so how did you find out that they were torturing the inmates? Yeah, so, uh, so our two days in the regular, you know, Camp Delta cell blocks, and then I got chosen along with four other guys, five other guys, to work on a special mission, they called it. And, and that special mission was Mamadou. And, uh, Mama Hamadou was the special mission you were going on. Yeah, he was like the second detainee chosen to go through torture by Donald Rums Rumsfeld. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, on a personal order by Donald Rumsfeld. Yeah, yeah signed by Donald. Hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. My first day going to you know guard him. The guards that we took over from, I mean, they they gave me details of, like you know, you know just, just things about a boat ride and like getting, you know I'm getting beat up and. Other crap, but uh, they they, yeah. they give they they gave you the details what happened to him or yeah that is very really similar to what's in the book yeah there's there's a few things they did they left out they they didn't want to look too guilty you know wow and how did you cope with that but I was also told that you know yeah because of that thousands of American lives were saved so mm -hmm. I, I I allowed it in my mind you know you know. I think it's, for us, it's, it's one of the bigger fears that you're put in the situation where you do things which you morally would, you know. Oh, it's horrible. It's, like, it's yeah. very frightening. Like, uh, yeah, they told us also that our job was to, like, build them back up, which that, like, to me, I was like, okay, thank God. That was probably the best news I heard, <laughs> you know. I was like, yeah. he was already damaged what I saw. It was, it was horrible. But how I, like, did that in my mind, it's accepted that he had been tortured and just didn't say anything. I don't know how. Cowardice. Sorry? Cowardice. I should I, I, I should have said something, you know. You would call it cowardice? You think you should have, or is that? Everything was so wrong anyway. I should have said something. Wow. If you, if you listen to your friend, Steve, what, can you remember the, that sort of first period when he came to Guantanamo? When he came, I was uh, very reclusive. I did not want to talk to anyone. And uh, I had like a life in my head that I created. And every time I speak with someone, they, they disturb the life that I created. And then I was always like in my cell. I was in isolation, total isolation. And then he came to me. And he was like almost half asleep. Said, uh, drink coffee. And I am not a big coffee drinker, but you don't want to tell he was the boss of the guard. And then I said, yes, he said, get out. And then I came, we sat in front of the cell, and then he made coffee. First chrickle coffee. <laughs> It was amazing. <laughs> World's best coffee. <laughs> I, God, like. I said it's good in Dutch. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> and then he told me to play cards. I said, yeah, like every country different. He said, okay, I teach you Rami. And he sat with me and he taught me Rami. And then uh, I started smoking him, actually. But he wouldn't admit to that. So, and then... Uh, <laughs> this is his day, I'll let's pretend. Yeah. <laughs> he smoked me, yeah. <laughs> this is a revenge, actually. We are using you because I want to take oh, a revenge. No. Revenge? <laughs> yes. He doesn't know it's coming. This one. <laughs> <laughs> Just to talk to me as a human being, and I was very scared of him. To, to build you up? Hmm? That was sort of the idea, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it was like, but he was like very kind to me. And that scared you? I wasn't thinking about fear or that. I was just surviving, actually. Mm -hmm. Everything I was doing just to stay alive, that's it. That's it. I just want to stay alive. And he was also like going out of his way to make me comfortable. He brought me pecan pie. Anyone ate pecan pie? <laughs> it's really good. It's really good. He brought me pecan pie like six pieces. I, I ate all of them. And I was like, 48 hours I couldn't sleep. <laughs> oh my God, seriously. 
And then we start the friendship. So I knew he was honest when we start gossiping about other people, <laughs> like interrogators. And uh, you, know, you know, we make fun. And then he starts making fun of the US government, which is like a big no-no. He took one time one pain because sometimes I'm very down, but he keep like encouraging me to talk to him. And then one time I said, I don't want. He said, get up, get up. I know I won't sleep. Get up, get up. And then he took this penny. He said, you know how much Al-Qaeda can store information in this penny? You know, I found it in yourself. I found it for yourself. And then just we have fun. And then he told me, of course, his real name, because that was also a no-go zone. Because up until then, you thought uh, the only thing you knew was that he was called Stretch. Yeah, but I knew it was fake. He, he found out within a day of every single but every single person that would, would go in there somehow, like that really? X-ray vision or something. <laughs> Seriously, he had some way to find out. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry to say this, but like they have fake names, and sometimes the tape falls, and it's like if someone forget to close, you know, their zipper after the bathroom, you see them, but you cannot tell them. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's awkward. That's exactly the same thing when it falls. I register the name, but I say nothing. You know, because they really, some guys, they really get really very, said, oh, and then they get very scared. And I, I don't want to scare them, you know. I just, I just the say nothing. The guys got scared when you knew their names? Yes. Some of them? Yes. Because, I mean, scared because of Because they were being, told being that I'm a very dangerous person and that I could order their killing from inside prison. This is true, you think it's a joke? Yeah. It's not a joke. I didn't believe that one, no. I, I... <laughs> they really tell them they I'm did say that, yeah. Yeah, sure. They did say that. Oh yeah, like dude, no personal information. We, we weren't supposed to talk about like what city we lived in or like no personal details at all. When did you start to find mm -hmm. out that he might not be sort of the total horror movie monster? Um, it was pretty quick. I mean, like... What is pretty quick? Like, is that like... I would say... Like... Probably a couple of months, honestly. It was, it, was a, it was a process for me, you know? Like, it was, it was not just what was going on in Guantanamo. It was also, like, what was going on in Iraq at the time. Mm -hmm. When I realized everything was fucking bullshit. Excuse my language, sorry. <laughs> everything was wrong that led up to Iraq. And pretty much every other, every, everything else that the U.S. Got, has been involved in, in, you know, in wars and stuff. And so I, I did a lot of research, had a lot of time. So I started questioning everything. And then, then I started questioning Guantanamo Bay, and it just kind of, it's a rabbit hole. So it's a combination of what you were reading, reading on, yeah. starting to realize, and going, was it daily with Mahamadou, sort of meeting him daily? or Almost was it? daily. Yeah. yeah, it was like two days on, one day off, I think. 12 hour days. I mean, it sounds weird in a way, but it must have been really hard for you to realize that you were in a place which was maybe not the right place or the, doing the right thing or being the, on the side of the righteousness. Oh yeah, still, like, I don't like knowing that I was a part of that place at all. Like, I, I'm still working on my karma for that one. Really? Yeah. And can you remember sort of the first time you realized that, hey, this is maybe not a terrible person, but maybe just somebody you could possibly be friends with? Strangely enough, it was like in the very beginning, like I, we had to act, you know, we're, because you, if we treated him nicely, he's going to continue to save thousands of people, you know, because he'd already been tortured, so. But I realized really quickly that he was actually a, a funny guy, a cool guy to hang out with, and like, I don't know, he seemed honest, and it's kind of a hunch too, I guess. Like, I felt like, it was like, oh, I really enjoy hanging out with this guy that might have been part of 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like, I mean, I mean, and then pretty quickly it spiraled into like, like yeah, sorry. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of things going on in my mind back then, for sure. Can you remember when you realized that you could become friends with one of your guards? So I never told him that I'm innocent or I'm guilty. I never brought up anything. Because to me, 
I want to go home. And I know that the people who can make that decision for me, they know that I'm innocent, and they decided, quote, unquote, unreleasable. That's my designation, unreleasable. That's it. And I never told him, oh, you know what, I'm innocent of everything, never once. You were probably unreleasable also because you were tortured. They were yes. afraid that, yes, correct. that your story yes. would get out. Yes, and they started like to uh, cover up this lies, just like he said, he saved life. You know what, he went through this, but through this torture, so many lives were saved. You know, that's the, the story. The, the lie, yeah, the story. Yeah, yeah, that's the story that they said. And, uh, you know, we, we were like acting like friends, but the power of this in this friendship is very unbalanced because he could use violence against me anytime, including killing me. He could break me, and all he needs to do is just write the report that I tried to hurt him, you know. That was not something I was very careful. I was aware of that. I was very careful, and we only came out of the friendship closet when I was a free man. <laughs> and then, <laughs> when we sat in Mauritania on this dune, I told him we look like a couple of guys who met through a dating app. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> and they said, don't say that. He's still like this, uh, stuck up. <laughs> You know. <clears throat> Shut up about the yeah, dating yeah, Americans. Yeah, I'm a, I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> yes. Remember when we sat making iftar on uh, yeah, on yeah. this? Uh, and I then, remember. That. Yeah, yeah. And then I told this guy, I said, "Don't, don't film that." I said, "But that's what it look like." <laughs> you know, we all both are like cute, sitting on, uh, you know, <laughs> very well dressed. You know. Oh, because wow. he couldn't tell. He always told me because people told him this guy is playing game with you. And then I, when I was a free man, I could make my decision. And everybody would understand this is my decision. I'm not under threat anymore. We made the best of the situation. You know, I think we did. And, uh, like, we didn't know if there was, like, you know, they're listening to us. They probably were, honestly. Yeah, yeah I remember not. Amy getting angry with one guard one time, because she always wants to control everything. And then she wants to be responsible uh, she is a military interrogator. She wants me only to be happy when she decides and to be upset when she decides. And then she does not want the guards to treat me in a way without consulting with her. And she gets very upset sometimes with the guy who uh, second rotation. And she really grilled them in front of me, which I didn't think it was professional. And she grilled also uh, Rachel. <laughs> wow. The way you describe it, we can laugh about it, but it's. I mean, it shouldn't be too surprising, a deranged place like that. Yes, yeah. very, very, that very sick. Sick and deranged things going yes. on. Like the week before I got there, actually, the guards all wore masks, like every day, and the only people that didn't were like, the interrogators. So they would like, so he would just, you know, just be excited to see a human face. And it'd be the evil fucking person that, you know, it's messed up. The whole thing was disturbing all the way through. Even when the interrogators are nice to him, like they're... It's all a game. all the flirting all and like... <clears throat> you know, war is really bad all around. So yeah. he does not maybe want to admit that he is also very damaged because you cannot visit pain on someone without visiting pain on yourself. And the camaraderie, the warmth of the camaraderie where he was in, he does not think about what you think now about. And no. Yeah, because he was in the middle of it. This was all good. America was attacked. Freedom was attacked. The free world was attacked. And I'm telling you that Dutch soldiers, they were part, they were doing also this job that Absolutely. Steve did. I know that. Mm -hmm. So, Because they saw this like defending the free world against the evil people. And I don't get that chance. Because I was born in Mauritania, or I was born in Morocco, or in Saudi Arabia, or in Iran, for that matter. And I do not accept that. And every time the journalists came back, come back to me, you know, they told me, OK, we talked to your former interrogator. They said you were not being honest with them. I always tell them a word I cannot repeat in this very respected 
you know, I think, you, I think you can. We're <laughs> yeah, because the premise, Yuri, is that me, because I was born in Mauritania, I don't have any rights. I have to talk to FBI. I told them I don't have to talk to anyone, you know. But when they torture me, I talk to them like there is no tomorrow, you know. And I wrote all kind of, you know, false confession. And uh, Steve came to repair like a broken man, you know. And uh, I was completely broken. And he used to come to me. You know, I was like in this very heavy nightmares. You know, I don't know what I was doing, but you saw it. I, I don't yeah. have any recollection, honestly. Yeah, it was like, yeah. It was just, just yeah. It was just not comfortable. Like, it just seeing him, you know, like going through something horrible in his sleep and like crying and like, you know, it's made me angry about like, you know, cause I know exactly what he was dreaming of, you know, or he could be dreaming that maybe there was me doing it in the future, you know, cause like, you know, what if they would have told me? I know that was always one of his fears is like, you yeah. know, his new guards all of a sudden told, oh, hey, it's starting to you know, turn up the heat, you know, so. I, yeah, if he was having night terrors, it was like, wake him up instantly, you know? Were you allowed to make your own decisions, whether how, to, how far to go with treating and how bad to treat the prisoners? Or were you supposed to just follow orders with that? Follow orders, like, I mean, the way, you know, the enhanced interrogation program went, I mean, like, once they're talking, you want to keep them talking, you know? They already broke them down to nothing. So then you start giving them a little reward. So, you know, we're just part of the reward system. So, well, but if you, if, if you would have just stopped talking, then I don't know what, what would have happened, you know? Were you happy to leave, sad to leave him? What, what kind of feeling went through your head when you were rotating it was, out? It's worry, honestly, because like, nobody had a clue where he was gonna be, like if he was gonna be dropped off in the ocean or, you know, hidden away somewhere. Like, they tried lying to, lying to him and saying he was gonna be in, uh, what's that federal program where, where you're uh, hidden away and, protect, you know, taking on a new identity. Uh, and, uh, witness yeah, protection. They said protection. they were gonna do that, take him to Florida or something. And like, yeah. we knew it was crap though. But, uh, it was special no clue, force. Yeah. He told me it was special force. Yeah, I, I figured he'd still be there right now, you know? You just told us that this was part of a process where you started realizing that maybe uh, the war was not such a good idea or maybe it was totally wrong or was that process finished when you came back from Guantanamo? No, I, was, I just wanted to know, you know, news about mom at the time, you know, because I, I was waiting for him to hear, you know, something about him, you know, if he was going to come home or not, and I was excited. So, uh, yeah, like Nancy wasn't really allowed to to speak with me honestly like so it was like really really brief conversations but she just said oh, no we're working hard but uh yeah I'll, we'll let you know and but yeah i always use a fake name and it was a really dumb one <laughs> and <laughs> yeah <laughs> a fake name with nancy hollander when you when you're asking about muhammadu yeah yeah, yeah. Then, then the email i would use also so she, so she would go and i think explain oh yeah your guard reached out and then she'd explain who I was, and it was like t wrong race and everything. <laughs> like, like he, he would know more about that part, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I she don't, came yeah. to me. So, so what he did in the end, so he was not sure because he was under what they call ND, non disclosure agreement. Non -disclosure NDA. Agreement. Yeah. NDA. I was so coward then, yeah. So, no, but he was just being like, you know, he wanted to help me, he was yeah. in a dilemma. So he wanted to help me, but he didn't know how to do it, you know. And then she came to me one day, she said, one of your former guards contacted me. I said, what's his name? She said the name. That, I said, that's fake name. And then she was like, I said, what his race? She said, he's black. <laughs> Guys, you know, she, because you met Nancy. Nancy is very sophisticated, very white. So, and to her, any accent that a little bit not very good is black. So his accent is black. 
I said, no. He wrote a letter, you know, and very beautiful letter. He will share it with you to the US government. Actually, he came out of the closet of fear, and he wrote a letter. And then he said, if you're afraid of him, I think, uh, correct me, he can come and stay with me. Something like yeah, that. Yeah. He said, he can come in my house. And, which confirm again the... <laughs> <laughs> Bunk beds, dude. This is Come Amsterdam. On. We're safe. We have bunk beds. <laughs> he would not be allowed to the USA anymore. Anyway. <laughs> Ask for asylum here. <laughs> I work with Syrian refugees. <laughs> they don't have place, but we can say you are Ukrainian. <laughs> we planned all this. <laughs> oh, and and what what made what made you decide to? come out in the open? I stopped caring what the government, you know, what the government thought. <laughs> For real, I was like, what are they going to do, you know? Well, you, yeah. you, you had seen what they could do. <laughs> Enough's enough, though. I mean, like, there's so much has happened since, since then that the government has done. It's, it's sick, you know? And what made you decide to reveal your real name to Nancy Hollander so that she could legally use that? Yeah, I mean, if it would would have been whatever that fake name was. I mean, it probably wouldn't even made it to the review board to uh, help him, you know? Yeah, because you wrote a letter to the review board, to the state, huh? yeah. uh, pleading yeah. for Mohamedou to be let out. Was there sort of a moment in which you decided this is enough is enough? I've been pretty angry at the government for a while, and uh, honestly, this is a phone call from a lawyer, and they, hey, will you do this? Yeah, sure. Actually, this the board was... respected your letter a lot. Really? Because it was very positive, you know, because he was like, in the US, you are a member of the tribe if you work for the government, you know. And they didn't see it as someone is betraying or anything because the information they have also that I was really innocent. So that corroborated what the intelligence they had. So, and I'm really very grateful and I say it in front of everybody. And I, take, I don't take him for granted. He is the godfather of my son, and I'm the godfather of his uh, uh, daughter, uh, Sama. He gave me, she was born when he was guarding me. He showed me this, uh, the picture uh, secretly, and when we met for the first time, he gave it to me. That's the picture he showed me in Guantanamo Bay. You showed it to Mohammed? In Guantanamo Bay, In Guantanamo Bay, yes. this picture? Yeah. Against was, the rules. I'm going to be leaving really soon after that, and I was like, I wanted to, like, like, hey, I do truly like you as a friend, you know? And then when we met many years after that, uh, he gave me that piece. My daughter is, like, a huge fan, too. Yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> seriously. Like, yeah. I didn't want anything else. I, I didn't want him to save me from anything, you know? You know, and he couldn't, like, get me out of prison if he wanted to. You've witnessed Mohamedou and others who've been broken. You think you can somehow understand what they've been through? No, nah, there's no way, like, no. Nah. Like, only he knows what he's been through, like, you know. I mean, it's very difficult to, I mean, it's very beautiful. It's very hard for me to understand yeah, how you manage to not hate the people you, who locked you up for 15 years. Indeed, I cannot re understand what you've been going through, but I would think that I would not be able to, you know. You know, we are very excited when Steve came to us and he stayed- In Mauritania. In Mauritania, he stayed in my house, everything. Mm -hmm. My nephew came to me, he said, who is this guy? You know, I said, he's my former guard. He said, why do you allow him in our house? I said, yeah, he's my friend. And he said, why? But he was your guard. And then he told me, did he have the key? I said, yes, he did have the key. <laughs> and I said, he said, could he open the door of the cell? I said, he could open the door. And he told me, but he did not. And then, uh, like Steve echoed some like that, that he, sh he, 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 uh, he wished he had like blew the whistle, you know, at that point, you know, about Guantanamo Bay, but, you know, it's very hard like to, for people to be other than the mainstream. It, 
takes a lot of weirdness and courage to say, I don't want to be part of this. Yeah. Because the group is very warm. Yeah. Being with the group, being agreeing with everybody, you know. And to me, forgiveness, it's how I find my peace and my freedom. Because I'm not doing it like to please anyone. I'm doing it because I really believe that, you know, uh, holding like grudges, it's like drinking poison and hoping that your enemy dies, like someone put it, you know? <laughs> I'm not drinking that poison. And I know I can go to my bed and I'm going to sleep like a child because I'm not holding any grudge. And I don't care what, when they made the movie. When he made me talk face to face to the people who uh, harmed me, yeah. some of them, they said, we are sorry, really. And so I said, no, no problem. I forgive you. And then this woman, she said, you should die. You don't, you don't deserve to live. I was laughing so hard. One of the women who tortured Because she was in pain, actually. And I know I wasn't in pain. She was in so much pain that she saw me breathing and outside of a mm -hmm. cell. It's for me, it's not for anyone else. And I'm a citizen, I, I need to be a good citizen because in order to promote also democracy and freedom, I need to forgive because, you know, I, I want people in this country to be in like 20, 30 years, not anymore to differentiate between someone who is coming from Somalia, Syria, and someone who is coming from Ukraine. You know, I want that. And I want people to be free everywhere. I want people to be free in Iran, to be free in Africa, in the Middle East. And I want us to cooperate. And I start with myself. And I do believe that American people are not my enemy. Absolutely not my enemy. I don't know how he does it. Like, <laughs> like yeah. I have to learn from him, though, like, because I hate the, a, lot, a lot of those guys, you know, like, the interrogators and stuff. And I want to, like, put their name, you know, out them to the media, you know, I, I would love that. And you know, just, uh, but yeah, he's, I mean, he's right, like, the, for, the forgiveness and, like, it's all important, but it's going to keep happening, you know? I mean, like, that's his job to forgive. That's awesome. It's beautiful. You know, Americans, we need to, like, and stand up and not let it happen anymore, you know? Because it, it, will, it will continue. You guys got to start, I mean, the rest of the world stand up and say, hey, you know, America's doing it wrong. Well, we've done our part in Holland in those wars, so that it would be true to stand up against you know, our policies as well. I mean, not yeah, I, mean, I understand, America, I understand but, that, but, but like, what, what would happen if you, if you didn't, that they would have punished you guys financially or something? I mean, like, The U.S. has a lot of power. I actually, I got to know, so Mr. X is one of the, uh, one of the worst ones in Mamadou. And I actually got to know him really well over, uh, just, just over the phone and stuff. Yeah, he was, uh, yeah, you're right. I had a grudge, you know? I, like, he was, he's forgiving and like, I'll be the one to be the asshole. And like, all it did was made me more angry at the U.S. He's like, like, he said this to me in tears. Like, he was like, you know, it was like, I, I was being told I was, I was a hero. I, I was saving thousands of lives. And like, it was just like, literally like word for word with, with, that was told to me to treat mom and do good, you know? So, so, so you're also saying you were just lucky that you were the one who've been told to treat him good. And Mr. X was the one who've been told to treat him bad. You're saying something also very beautiful, I think. Forgiving, I do it for me. You have a very beautiful saying in, in our tradition. It's a verse that says, if you forgive, you get closer to uh, completeness. Mm -hmm. That's forgiving. It's like, uh, it's very important. I'm not saying this, I was always this way, you know, because in the beginning, I did not want to forgive. In the beginning of my kidnapping, mm -hmm. I was very angry, yeah. you know. I did not want to forgive, but I always, like, ask myself, so what do I want as revenge? Do I want to kill everybody who did anything to me? Do I want to kill their families? Do I want like to bomb them like they did bomb us? I didn't, I didn't have any answer how much I would be satisfied. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that would satisfy me is forgiveness. And then it was, oh, this is it. I just 
you know, you know, and it also goes, it, it's in the keeping with my promise to be a kind person, even self-serving, like, because people could see in the camp that I really didn't mean them any harm. And Steve know that everybody he met said, I really like Muhammad, though I don't think that he's a bad guy, you know? That's almost everyone, you know? I'm um, thanking you both very much from the bottom of my heart for this conversation. I'm uh, really impressed with both of you. I think it's amazing uh, uh, what we've seen here. Um, it says a lot on the positive side, on what people are actually capable of in a very positive way. This was actually the last meeting of a year of uh, artists in residence of Mohamedou Old Sly. We're very, very proud that you did. Um, we're very, very happy with that. But uh, today we heard that uh, the Fay Fonds uh, is allowing us to extend your artist in residentship. Uh, so the next year we're going to have more of those conversations and especially going to a very large amount of Dutch schools, uh, which you've been doing the last two, three weeks already uh, with the Bali visiting schools, talking to children, um, bring, building bridges to the future. Thank you very much, Veronica Baas and Jante Mosselman for putting this series together. Wonderful, wonderful work. And thank you for thank coming you. and sharing. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.